So, hi everybody, and welcome to this last Rock and Talk of 2023. And we look forward to seeing you again in February next year for the next one. So, the subject today is myths of low carbon concrete. Um, I'm not going to promise that I'm going through everything here because uh, it's really a very challenging subject with an awful lot to say, but hopefully you find it interesting. Now, the first thing to emphasize is the fact we need to act very fast in terms of CO2 reduction. This graph shows various scenarios for various reductions. You can see the really catastrophic business as usual case would take us to an increase in temperature of seven degrees by the end of the century. And it's only this bottom curve, which is going to net zero by 2050, that has any chance of keeping us um, below 1.5 or two degrees. So it's much more important <laughs> to be able to do something now than in 50 years time. And this means we should really think about where we should put our resources in terms of money, effort, brain power. And I think we should really think about putting these behind things which can deliver big short-term gains. So the first myth I'm going to start with is that materials based on cement are in fact high carbon materials. This is the impression many people have because globally cement-based materials account for about 8% of world CO2 emissions. But this is purely because of the enormous amounts used. We produce about 30 billion tons of materials based on cement, that's to say concrete and mortars. And as you can see in this graph at the top right, in fact, on an intrinsic basis, that's to say energy or emissions per kilogram, the cement-based materials are right down in this lower left corner, much lower embodied energy than steel, um, aluminium, plastics, etc. Now, people can say, well, that's not a fair comparison because you can do more with uh, a ton of wood than you can a ton of uh, cement. To a certain extent, that's true, but we really need to compare materials on this basis of the kilograms of CO2 equivalent per meter squared of building. And this graph is from a study that came out last year, the reference is at the bottom. And really you can see that across all these different material types, there's not all that much difference. What is also striking though, is the tremendous dispersion particularly in this first um, column of mass concrete. And you can see the building in the study with the lowest CO2 per square meter was in concrete, but also the building with the highest. And if we can find ways of eliminating all these ones up here, you can see easily that the average would drop. And because it's such a widely used material, this would have enormous um, impact worldwide. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy about comparisons with wood. I'm not gonna go into this here, but I would refer you to this recent report that was issued by the World Resources Institute. You can find it easily online by typing some of the keywords in this title. So let's look at that first myth and realize that it really is a myth because materials based on cement are actually about the least carbon intensive materials available. So the second myth is to say that, you know, these are hard to decarbonize material. There's nothing we can do. Now that couldn't be further from the truth. So in 2017, we wrote this report with Guillaume Albert and Aurélie Favier, and we showed that if you really work through the value chain, that's to say you start with very efficient production of clinker, you use alternative fuels, then you minimize the clinker content in the cement by using supplementary cementitious materials. Then you make concrete efficiently by having good grading of your aggregate, good admixtures. 
And then you design efficiently to reduce the amount of concrete to construct a given building. And finally, we have to think, well, do we really need to build at all? Can we not reuse buildings? And if we do demolish buildings, then we need to recycle the components. And we demonstrated here that if we put all these things together, even using existing technologies, we could have very substantial emissions up to even 80% by working through the whole value chain. And this was confirmed by a more recent study, which came out in Nature Communications, which calculated with the same kind of strategies, a possible reduction of 76%. Now, as I've emphasized here, the key is working through the value chain. And here we have to bring the different parts of the industry together. And this is why the GLOBE consensus has been created. This is an action of six professional societies listed at the right, including RILAM, including FIB, CIB, European Steel Association, EABSE, and International Shell Structures. You can find out more on this website, and I made a recent presentation on GLOBE at the recent COP28. You can view on this website. So this is one key thing we need to think about, how to bring the different elements of the industry together to achieve the reductions we know are possible. Now, another way of looking at these reductions is shown here. So the vertical axis is CO2 reduction, but it's schematic, it's not quantitative. And you can see here again, the different levers, making efficient design, efficient concretes, savings in cement and binders, switching to alternative fuels. And then there's still going to be a gap. You can't produce totally zero CO2 concrete with just these levers. Eventually, you're going to have need some measure of carbon capture and either usage or storage. But here we see a really huge change in the cost. And that's the important point. We need to maximize the savings we can get from these things up here, which have very low or even negative um, cost to minimize the amount of carbon capture. Because carbon capture is going to increase the cost of producing clinker by around two to four times. So let's go back to this myth that they're hard to decarbonize materials. No, we have lots of routes based on existing technologies to achieve very substantial reductions going through the value chain, using concrete more efficiently in construction, avoiding over design, large spans, very high buildings, using cement more efficiently in concrete, which can be as simple as good grading of aggregates and using super plasticizers, substituting clinker and cement by supplementary and cementitious materials, and producing clinker efficiently by using alternative fuels. Now, before I go on to look at the other myths, I want to just emphasize the dimensions of this industry. It's really colossal, and this is very important. We produce about 4 billion tons of cement per year. We have about 3,000 cement plants in the world. We have tens of thousands of concrete ready-mix uh, plants, and we have millions of people mixing and placing concrete on site. If we're gonna have impact, we have to have solutions that can reach right through this value chain. And finally, we've got these 30 billion tons of cement-based materials at an incredibly low cost. And I want you to really remember this, that the marginal cost of clinker production, it's not to say the, the total cost with all the investment, but the marginal cost is less than $50 a ton practically everywhere in the world, and some places very much less than that. And that's the challenge, because we have to find solutions that are economic compared to existing solutions. Niche solutions will have negligible impact on CO2 emissions for obvious reasons. And just to show you that you know alternatives really are niche, if we take the example of calcium aluminate and calcium sulfoaluminate cements, these have been around for a long time, many decades, but they're not more 
than about one thousandth, 0.1 percent of the market. So, you know, clearly, even if they were completely zero carbon, it would, has n virtually no impact on the overall emissions. And the other thing we have to bear in mind is where cement is being used. So here we see the changing pattern of cement use over the last 70 years or so. Um, we see that the um, use in the global north is hovering around 10% or so. What's happened in the last three decades has been the tremendous growth in China, but this is now going down. And in the next decades, we're going to see another switch around from China to other developing regions like Africa, India, etc. But we can see that the total demand for cement is not going to increase hugely. This means we actually don't need many new clinker plants. Okay, we need them in different places. We need them in India rather than China, for example. But, you know, new solutions to providing clinker, you know, we don't need them because we already have enough clinker plants. And you have to bear in mind the huge capital cost of these kind of production facilities. So, the next myth I'm going to look at is quite a simple one to deal with. Should we use very high levels of slag replacement? Well, we can use high levels of slag replacement because the composition of slag here is very close to that of Portland cement. It's in the area of calcium silicate hydrate. And this means that substitution levels up to even 80 or 90% can be used and are allowed in many norms. However, the problem is that we have a limited availability of slag. And this question is dealt with very nicely in this report shown here, which was put together by a group uh, mainly based in the UK and led by the Institute of Structural Engineers in the UK. And this discusses all the sources of the figures, and you know what we should do, but basically it boils down to this. Slag is a limited supply. It's about around 10% of the amount of cement we produce. So you can either spread that 10% out across all co concretes, or somebody can say, well, I want to go to a very high level of slag replacement in my project. Well, the consequence of that is that you take slag away from all the other projects. And in terms of the global CO2, which is of course what we care about, you have no net further reduction. So this is a very important point. It really doesn't help by increasing levels of slag replacement. And what perhaps we should focus more on is what is the most efficient use of slag. And here we can imagine to look at the amount of CO2 or global warming potential as a function of a property like strength or chloride resistance or something like that. And what we want by using slag is to increase, decrease this efficiency so we have less global warming potential for the concrete. And we come to a point here um, shown schematically, which would be the ideal replacement level because if we go beyond that, then because the property decreases, because say, for example, the strength decreases, we're actually increasing global warming potential. So this is what we need to think about, and we probably need more data to really say where this level should be. So coming back to that third myth, the idea that we just use high levels of slag replacement really doesn't take us very far because the world supply of slag is very limited. It's almost all used already. So there's negligible potential for further reduction. And, and what we want to know is what is the optimum replacement level. So the fourth myth, which is gaining a lot of popularity at the minute, a lot of venture capitalists are investing in this idea, is to say, can we make cement from non-carbonated calcium sources? Now, what do I mean here? Well, if we look at the CO2 emissions from cement, we see that about 60% of those emissions 
come from the breakdown of limestone. So limestone is calcium carbonate, which is about 80% of the raw material. And during the production of cement, this is breaks down to calcium oxide, which goes on to form the clinker minerals and CO2. So if you see this, you say, well, can we use something other than limestone? Well, limestone is very convenient because it concentrates the calcium. And if we look at the composition of the Earth's crust here on the left, compared to the composition of a typical Portland cement, of course, the huge difference you see is the much higher amount of calcium in the cement. Now, limestone is this concentrated source of calcium because of the natural carbon cycles going on in the world. And I'm very grateful to this slide from Ruben Snellings because this really demonstrates the conundrum. What we have is we have rocks produced by volcanoes, which have, roughly speaking, the average composition of the Earth. Over time, these weather and the basic um, oxides, calcium oxide and magnesium oxide, combine with calc CO2, they take CO2 out of the atmosphere to produce limestone, dolomite, etc. And this is very important. This is the reason we can live on planet Earth, because CO2 has been removed from the atmosphere over time by this weathering, um, which needs water. And therefore, we kept being able to keep the CO2 in the atmosphere low. Now, just to summarize this, and I admit it's a grossly simplified view of geology. I apologize to all geologists, but, you know, we have these volcanoes producing rock. They have an average composition, things like basalt. Weathering breaks down these rocks. The basic components react with atmospheric CO2. The acidic components like silica, alumina, iron oxide form minerals like quartz, feldspars, and eventually clays. So let's look at, you know, the idea some people have of let's go back to basalt. This is a typical composition of basalt. I just picked off ResearchGate. And you can extract the calcium from this. What you can do, you can dissolve it up in acid. And then there are well-established technologies from the mining industry whereby you can precipitate the different oxides separately. This is the same basic technology that is used to extract all things like rare earths, etc. And then you can make clinker from the uncarbonated limestone. There's just one problem. Well, there's two problems with this. The first is the cost. So the cost would be around $800 a ton. This is about um, 20 times higher than the cost of producing clinker today. And remember, even clinker with carbon capture and storage was only three to four times the cost. And the other problem is you would end up with more than 80% of these materials are here are not what you want. And you've got to do something with that. What do you do? You pile it up in a, in a pile of waste or what? And we also have to consider that there's another method of using the potential of these rocks to take CO2 out of the atmosphere which is much simpler. So here's a company uh, in the UK, Undo, which is just simply grinding up the basalt, same basalt, spreading it on fields. And the great thing is it can actually increase crop reels. So in terms of cost benefit analysis, this technology of just grinding the basalt up, it, it absorbs the same amount of CO2 in the end, you don't have to have all the expensive energy to do this processing. And, you know, I think it's a bit of a no brainer, which is the most straightforward thing to do. And then there are people who say, well, can we take calcium from seawater? The concentration is about 400 parts per million. Nevertheless, each meter cubed of seawater contains roughly a kilogram of calcium. So could we extract that? Well, if you think about this, it's kind of the down the the opposite of desal. Well, it's the con another consequence of desalination. So we've got pretty good figures for desalination. Uh, it's about three kilowatt hours for the desalination of one ton of water, 
And if you so if you multiply that up to say, well, how much energy you need to uh, extract potentially one ton of calcium and what's the cost of that energy, it works out you would need about $300 for seawater containing one ton of calcium. Now, people could say, well, if you're doing the desalination at any rate, that cost doesn't matter. But unfortunately, you don't end up with nice calcium after that because the desalination residue is still very wet and you would have to spend about 10 times that amount of energy to get a dry residue. And then you would have to separate the elements in the residue, which is the same as the situation of basalt, which I described earlier. So even in a very generous scenario, you're talking about a cost range between 1,000 and 10,000 per tonne of the calcium oxide. And again, remember, the cost of clinker today is less than $50. And even if you add on CCUS, it would still be below about $150. So really, again, this is just not practical. And, you know, in terms of capacity, all of the desalination plants in the world today could potentially only supply the equivalent of something like five to 10 cement plants. So this myth, well, we could make cement from non-carbonated calcium sources, but the cost would be orders of magnitude higher than even using carbon capture and storage with the existing routes of producing clinker. And it would also require massive investment in new processing plants. We already have the clinker plants. Of course, it's going to be expensive to install carbon captures technology, but it is something that is you know, really being done in demonstration today. And we can imagine in a decade or so, it's going to be more viable. So the last myth I'm going to look at is, you know, should we go to cements from magnesium silicate? Do these offer the possibility of carbon negative cements? Well, there's various aspects of this. First of all, we have to look at the location of the magnesium silicate. Then we have to consider how we can convert the magnesium silicate to magnesium oxide, because that's the material you need that can then harden by carbonation. And then we need to consider the standardization. So this map here shows the distribution of magnesium silicates. You can see they're really occurring at plate boundaries because there's a lot of magnesium silicate in the magma, which is thrust up by the, again, volcanic action at plate boundaries. And here you can see quite easily that, for example, if we take Africa, where there's going to be most increase in demand, no supply of magnesium silicates, you would have to put in place very important transportation costs um, to get the magnesium silicates here. There's a lot up here in the north of Europe, but there's not many people there, so not much demand for cement. Then you've got to have your reaction. So the overall thing is you want to take this magnesium silicate here, you want it to absorb CO2, and what you're going to end up with in the solid product is magnesium carbonate. Now, to do that, what you do is, first of all, convert the magnesium silicate into magnesium oxide, and this is the challenging step. I'm not going to go into all the details. There's a lot of work going on on this, and surely progress will be made in the coming years. But let's just suppose that solutions can be found, which do not require too much energy and can be scaled up. This will take a while, but maybe it's possible. But before I go on, I just want to point out something else, that again, we've got this problem of residues. And if really you're going to produce this on a large scale, you need to find a way to get rid of these residues. Now, then we have the materials that harden by reacting with CO2 from the atmosphere. This is the whole key to it. They can take CO2 out the atmosphere. But with this kind of hardening reaction, there are two key points. First of all, you have to get CO2 into the element. This limits the size. And it limits the, you know, you have to have a certain amount of porosity. And we know porosity is related to strength. And this means you can really only make things like blocks and tiles. And then you've got a pretty low pH, which will not protect steel reinforcement. OK, we could use other reinforcements, but this is all very complicated, would require new standards. 
And in terms of standards, the point here, we've got a completely new chemistry. We've got no knowledge of long-term performance. And even to make extremely simple changes, like increasing the amounts of common supplementary cementitious material in standards, can take five to 10 years. We've only got 25 odd years to solve this problem. We haven't got time to wait for these magnesium silicates to be developed and to be adopted in the standards. So in terms of this myth, we could say there's some potential long-term, but it's gonna be very niche. There's the question of cost, the scalability, the fact you can only make small elements. Trying to compete with existing concrete blocks is very challenging as these are very low cost. They're actually very low carbon because they don't have much cement in. And because they're porous, they actually reabsorb CO2 from the atmosphere as well. And then we have to consider that magnesium as a metal is also a critical material. So there are competed uses. And finally, like the example we saw for the basalt, there are many people looking at the possibility of accelerated weathering. So, you know, this is a kind of micro niche solution and that's not what we want. We need big term scalable solutions. So just to summarize what I've tried to present here, cement, I want to emphasize again that cement based materials are already low carbon options. The fact that we use huge volumes it's a negative, but it's also a positive because we can have huge potential gains in terms of the world's CO2 problems. We can save up to 80% with known technologies if the industry works together at all the different levels. We need to get this working through the value chain. This is why we formed the GLOBE consensus. We need to look at clinker, cement, concrete construction, all together, not just say we need to solve everything at the cement level because we can't get enough reduction just at that level. We've seen that blast furnace slag, a very good way to reduce CO2, but the amount available is limited and we're already exploiting all its potential. Non-carbonated calcium oxide is very far from being economically practical and Magnesium silicate, well, it may be a very small niche product, but it's really not going to deliver anything meaningful before 2050, which is what we've got to focus on. So we really need to think about solutions in a wider context. We have to be aware of the materials availability. That's not just the total amount, but where it is, what's the transportation. We need to think the cost, the cost relative to this solution, which is challenging, but nevertheless accessible of carbon capture and storage. And we need to think about you know, standards. That's why it makes sense to have solutions which are quite close to the ones we have today, such as, for example, increasing the incorporation of supplementary cementitious materials. This can be rolled out very fast at large scale and uh, save a lot of CO2. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions and um, we'll move to that right now. Will I manage to stop this recording? All uh, right. <laughs>